All right. So uh, professional introductions aside for a second, I just want to note that with that groovy lead in music, every single time I encourage the classes and the speakers to dance at their desks. No scientist has ever done better dancing or more fun in the background than Victoria. So I just want to say a kudos to her for that before I lead in with some serious stuff. Uh, welcome in, everyone. My name is Jesse. Welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For many of you, you joined us already in our 35 plus broadcast to start the school year already, in which case, welcome back. So nice to have you. If you are new to us joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Today is the sort of perfect example of what we do best. We are having five broadcasts today total. We talked with Natalie Ouellette, the James Webb Space Telescope. We went to hang out on the Falcor off the Galapagos Islands talking about vertical coral reefs. We just wrapped up with Forest Health and Grossmore National Park. Today's broadcast right now, which we'll dive in with in a second. And then right after this, we get to hang out with the world's coolest cave diver. Like it's a crazy, insane day. If you're keen to check out any of those other programs or this one in like three weeks or three years down the road, Head to our YouTube channel. They'll all be there forever. Lots of opportunity to keep the fun going. Now, I'm really, really thrilled for all of you to join me in meeting one of my very favorite scientists in the world, someone who I used to live in the same city with, and then we just completely went to the opposite side of the country. I'm closer to North Africa than I am to Victoria now, uh, but I want to welcome in Dr. Victoria Arbor from the World BC Museum, who's going to tell us a little story today about chasing dinosaurs in British Columbia. Now, I remember growing up as a boy, I didn't think there were dinosaur fossils in BC, so this is really freaky for me, too. We're going to learn a little bit about what field work uh, going to look for dinosaur fossils is like, hear about some of her amazing stories, and I'm so excited for all your questions. Without further ado, Dr. Arbor, welcome to the broadcast, and uh, nice to see you. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> ah, well, I know you've got a lot to share with us, so I'll bring up your fantastic, wonderful slide deck, and we will yeah. dive in again. Great. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for joining this stream today and tuning in. Um, like Jesse said, my name is Victoria. I'm the curator of paleontologists here at the Royal BC Museum in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. We're on Vancouver Island, so way on the west side of Canada. Um, and my job here at the museum as a curator is to do sort of three big things. So the first thing I do is I research and I study dinosaurs and I learn more about them. I learn about other fossils too, but I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, so I really focus on learning about dinosaurs. Um, I help us get new fossils for the collection and look after the fossils in our collection here at the museum. And then the third thing that I'm doing today is I get to tell people like you all about what we've learned. So I do a lot of talking to different kinds of people all over the world sometimes. And um, yeah, that's kind of what makes my job as a curator here really exciting and fun is trying to figure new things out and then tell people about them. So I'm located in, um, I got to Click my thing here. There we go. I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia, but I'm actually going to be talking about work that we did this summer up in northeastern British Columbia. And the fossils that we found up there are on Treaty 8 territory. And in particular, I'm really, really thankful to the Soto First Nation for permission to conduct this research on their land. And we were really excited to have one of their elders, Tom Aird, join us for our work this summer. And we're really excited about the different collaborations we can work on going forward. This is a brand new project that we just started this summer. And it's some, something that we're probably going to go back to over and over again for at least the next five or six years. So we've got lots of work ahead of us. And you're getting kind of the first sneak peek of what we did on our first year of this project. So this diagram might look a little complicated, but it's actually not that much. This is basically... Um, the way geologists and paleontologists think about time. So when you guys think about time, you might think of your watch or a clock, like a nice round circle. And geologists and paleontologists like me think about time as those stacks of little boxes, basically. So when I think about things being older or younger, I think about things being up or down, basically. So on this particular diagram, we're looking at geologic time and the different names that geologists and paleontologists use for different periods of time, kind of like we might say it's 12 o'clock or Monday, we talk about the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. So on this particular diagram, the oldest stuff is about 160 million years old at the very bottom, and the youngest stuff is at the top about 66 million years ago. And that's what the end of the age of dinosaurs, the end of the Cretaceous period, when dinosaurs went extinct. 
So like Jesse was saying, a lot of people don't really think about um, British Columbia as being a good place to find dinosaur fossils. And I think part of that is because we sit next door to Alberta, which has a ton of dinosaur fossils. It's probably the best place to get dinosaur fossils in Canada and one of the best places in the world. Uh, but British Columbia do, does have fossils uh, of dinosaurs. They're just harder to find. They're often up in mountains or along rivers. We don't really have the same badlands that places like Alberta or Montana or Utah do. So it just takes a bit more work and they're a little bit harder to find. Uh, but we do have some dinosaur bone examples. Most of them are from the very end of the age of the Cretaceous. We know that we've got uh, some Tyrannosaur fossils. We have duckbill dinosaur fossils. And we have our very own unique dinosaur called Ferrosaurus sustadensis, who we usually just call Buster because it's a little shorter. Um, and he's a little relative of Triceratops. We also have some armored dinosaurs and some ancestors of duckbill dinosaurs, but there's still a lot more for us to learn about the dinosaur fossil record from dinosaur bones in BC. And so that's part of what I do uh, here at the museum. We do have some places we go collect dinosaur bones, but today I wanna to talk about dinosaur footprints because dinosaur footprints are also really cool. They are also dinosaur fossils, they're just not the bones of dinosaurs. So it is really possible for animals to leave their footprints in the fossil record and have them fossilize and survive millions and millions of years. It's pretty amazing to think about, but it happens all the time actually. Um, and in British Columbia, we probably have one of the best records of dinosaur footprints in all of Canada and maybe even North America and some of the best records in the world because they span a really, really long period of time. We have dinosaur footprints that are at least as old as about 150 million years, all the way up to about 75 to 60 million years old. And what's really neat is that the footprints can tell us a different story than the dinosaur bones do. So the footprints uh, have records of dinosaurs that we haven't found bones from yet and sometimes even of dinosaurs that we haven't found elsewhere in Canada yet. So by using the different footprints that we find, we can actually get a really amazing picture of dinosaur diversity in BC and how that changes over long stretches of geologic time, millions and millions of years. So even though we can't always tell exactly what dinosaur made each footprint, we can't necessarily say like this specific species made this footprint, we can get a pretty good idea of the different types of dinosaurs that were around based on the footprints we find. We know things that like armored dinosaurs, the ankylosaurs are found pretty much throughout the whole Cretaceous in British Columbia. We know that things like Tyrannosaurs and T-Rex only appear at the very end. We know that sauropods, the long neck dinosaurs are only found early in the Cretaceous and maybe the Jurassic, and then they disappear. So that gives us lots of questions to ask about how dinosaurs are changing in BC and elsewhere in the world. So the footprints are really, really fun to study. So the footprint site that I'm talking about today that we went to work at this summer is about 110, 115 million years old in this chunk of time that we call the Albion and the Aptian. Um, and it's located in northern BC. The very first time I got to see this footprint site was in May 2019 when I went on a field trip with a bunch of other paleontologists to go check out this cool site that some of my friends and colleagues at the Tumblr Ridge Museum had been working on. So what you're looking at here is um, a, a big flat area all, where all the people are standing is a big chunk of rock where dinosaur footprints are exposed at the surface. We're going to take a close look at them later in the presentation. So that's actually a pretty big area, but what's really cool about this site is where I'm standing and where you can see all the sort of rubbly rock in the front uh, is basically just some rock that's covering up more of those footprints. So there's probably hundreds more footprints that could be discovered if we keep excavating this particular site. So I thought this was a really cool spot. And <clears throat> a few years ago, my colleagues moved on to some other projects. And so now the Royal BC Museum and University of Victoria are gonna go up and sort of keep going on the work that they started a few years ago and learn more about this dinosaur footprint site. So here's a map of British Columbia. <clears throat> We're located down on Vancouver Island, that little that sort of big island down in the very lower uh, bottom left. And we drove all the way up to this place called Hudson's Hope up by the star, and then stayed there. It takes us two days. BC is a really big province. Um, we drove up to Hudson's Hope, stayed there, and then we would drive back and forth to where this track site is found every day. Um, uh, where that big star is. So one of the neat things about where the footprint site is located is that we get to drive over this really, really big bridge that is actually a dam. So the footprints are found on the, on the south side of something called Williston Lake, which isn't actually a real lake, it's a reservoir. 
So this dam was built in the 1960s and 70s as a way to make electricity for the province of BC. So here we are driving across the dam. You can see there's water on one side and a big drop off on the other side. Um, and one of the really interesting things about this area is that some of the very first footprints of dinosaurs in BC were actually found along this river. This river is called the Peace River and footprints were found all along the banks of the Peace River back in the 1930s by some of the first Western scientists working here. And uh, unfortunately, most of them are actually now underwater in the reservoir. So having a chance to find another dinosaur footprint site that isn't underwater is really exciting because we can sort of keep study going of these footprints that were otherwise kind of lost to science a long time ago. So every day we would drive across the dam and then we would drive another 45 minutes along a uh, logging road. So this is a road used by forestry workers to log and get trees and wood, um, but it's really hard on tires. So we actually managed to blow up two of our tires while we were there for about 10 days. So that's another good trick you have to learn in, uh, as a paleontologist is how to fix tires fairly quickly. Uh, once we would drive down this gravel road, we would then walk up a little ATV trail carrying all of our gear, uh, and then we would be at the footprint site. So this is just an overview of what a typical day would look like at the track site. So I'm gonna talk about the footprints towards the end, but I kind of wanted to talk first about how we actually go about studying dinosaur footprint sites. So what in this particular picture, everyone's doing lots of different work, everyone's really busy, and all those little dark depressions that you can see on the ground are dinosaur footprints. So this site currently has about 700 square meters of surface exposed with footprints, and there are hundreds of footprints. They're all over the place, all different kinds of dinosaurs, it's really, really cool. Here's a little overview of some of the gear that we bring to the site every day. So this big metal square thing is our mapping square, a grid square that we use for making a map. I'll talk about it in a few minutes. We always have our backpacks. We have lots of buckets and kneeling pads and brooms and brushes for sweeping out the footprints and clearing them out. We have things like chisels and hammers for excavating new footprints. Uh, we have safety gear like bear spray because we are definitely in bear country and we saw a couple of bears not too far away from the track site when we were there. And we've got these yellow and blue buckets that have materials for making replicas of the footprints as well. So we always have lots of stuff piled up at the side of the track site every day. Um, lots of different tools that we use for the different projects. One of the biggest things we were doing this summer was making maps of the footprint site. So it's so big we can't capture the whole thing in like one photograph. So one of the things that we do is we make really detailed maps on paper. We draw them by hand using a grid square and a thing called a plumb bob. So in the video, you're seeing um, Derek in the hat and then Andrea wearing the, or uh, yeah, Andrea wearing the camouflage t-shirt. Uh, Andrea is holding something called a plumb bob. So it's like a heavy piece of metal with a point and she drops that down onto the, uh, the grid square. And then we can basically map out where all of the different toes and feet and heels and little marks on the surface are so that we can make a map on the piece of paper that Derek is holding. So we usually have at least two or three people doing mapping pretty much all day. It can take a little while because you have to interpret what you're seeing um, and, uh, and make sure that you're recording everything. It's a really important part. This is what one of those map sheets looks like at the end of the day. So this one has four of those grids in it. You can see lots of different footprints sort of going all over the place. We would mark down things like what uh, if only the toes are impressed or if it's really hard to see or if it's a really good footprint. We might mark if there's cracks or plants or other things that we see on the surface. So we just collect as many observations as we can as this first step of doing the scientific research. Each of those footprints then gets a little number. You can see numbers written on them. And then in my fun notebook, I get to write down all of those numbers, what kind of footprint I think it is. And we take lots of measurements like how long it is, how wide it is, what direction it's pointing in. And then all of this information comes back to the museum with us. One of the other things that we wanted to do was actually make some copies of some of the footprints. So footprints are actually really hard to collect and bring back to museums. So when we go out to like look for dinosaur bones, we almost always collect them and bring them back to the museum. But footprint sites are a little bit different because usually what we're interested in is how the footprints are related to each other. So do the footprints represent one animal walking in a straight line? Is it a muddy surface that they trampled all over? Are there different types of dinosaurs interacting with each other? And those are not things that you can easily collect. So we can't collect 700 square meters and put it in the museum, it's way too big. 
So what we did was we took some uh, silicone molds of some of the footprints that we thought were really interesting or very representative of the different types of footprints we saw. So this is a video and a photo of our fossil preparator, Calla Scott. And this was actually new for us. We hadn't really done a lot of this work before, so it was really fun to learn and, and figure out the best way to do this. What Calla is doing is she's got a bucket, a little container in her hand with um, some stuff called silicone in it. And then she's mixed it up and is uh, dabbing it into the footprint very, very carefully. Uh, and that will sort of harden up and over time become kind of like a flexible rubber. It takes about an hour for it to turn from the liquid into the rubber. But we can't just put one layer on. So it actually, each footprint gets at least four layers of um, the silicone. You have to wait an hour each time. And then at the very end, you put on a nice hard cap of plaster so that it has something rigid to sit on and so it holds its shape. So collecting one footprint mold basically takes almost an entire day of work, even though it's mostly like sitting around waiting for the for the, the paint to dry, so to speak. Um, but that was really fun. So we collected quite a few different molds of some of the fossils. Those come back to the museum and sit in our collection. And then we can actually make casts of those that would look like the footprints that you see in the, in the video here. So she's just very carefully dabbing it in and uh, yeah, making sure that all the little nooks and crannies are filled in. <clears throat> here you can see Calla peeling off the hard shell this is called the support jacket. So it's made out of plaster and little pieces of burlap or potato sack. And then once that has dried and she's pulled that off, she's gonna very, very carefully peel off the mold, the silicone mold. So it's a little bit sticky on the footprint and we don't wanna break the footprint. So this part's a little bit tedious and touchy, but uh, it usually comes off really, really well. And then we get that nice footprint. So some of the students are helping her and she's just kind of like very carefully peeling up the edges and peeling it off. I'll just let it run for a moment so you guys can watch the, this extremely exciting process. <laughs> we always want to make sure that we don't break anything and, or peel up a lot of the rock along with it. You can see it's quite time consuming to peel it off. So one of the other things that we can do at the footprint site is we will make these physical copies of the footprints, but we also make digital copies of the footprints using photographs. So here my student Andrea is taking tons and tons of photos along a trackway of a big plant eating dinosaur called a sauropod. Those are the long neck dinosaurs. And these footprints were really big, so we didn't think we could actually mold them and bring them back in our car this year. Um, but we really wanted to have a record of them in three dimensions. So we do different things. We have our maps in two dimensions, we have our physical molds, and we can also make digital copies of the fossils. So by taking lots of photos from different angles, she's getting all of her squats in today on this one. <laughs> by taking lots of photos of different angles all around the footprint, we can use a special software called Agisoft Metashape to do a technique called photogrammetry. So by taking all of these photos, putting them in the computer and then doing lots of processing, we can actually make a 3D model in the computer just from the photos of the footprints. So that's what you're taking a look at here, which I think is really cool. Um, and it's really easy and it's relatively cheap, all things considered. So this is a great way for us to also have copies of the fossils in different formats, being able to do bigger things than we would be able to do physically, um, what's really cool with these files is we can send them to our colleagues if they want to study them. It's really easy to just email them a file. We can also do things like 3D printing. We can make little tiny versions or we can make full size versions if we want to. So this is just a different way of collecting data about the footprints um, compared to some of the more traditional ways like molding and casting like I was showing. So we use all these different techniques to get lots of information while we're there for a short period of time. So in addition to collecting all of this data on the footprints that were already at the surface at the track site, we also wanted to see how hard it was to actually uncover new footprints. And so this is where we switched over to some heavy duty tools like pickaxes and shovels. So here we've got Andrea using a pickaxe and Emily is using a shovel to clear away some of the rubble that's on top of the layer that has the footprints in it. Uh, you might notice that we're wearing masks in this. So up in northern eastern BC this summer, there was a lot of fires. And uh, while we were up there, it was actually really smoky some days. So in order to protect our lungs, we actually wore masks outside a lot of the time uh, when the smoke was really bad. So that's kind of a new challenge for us uh, working in northern BC that I wasn't used to um, 10 years ago working in Alberta or in the southern US. So just some different challenges about working in, in different places in the world. 
Once we get a lot of the rubble off of the top of the layer, we're able to get right down to the layer where the footprints are located. And we're actually able to um, use smaller tools like brushes and chisels and screwdrivers, little pokey picky tools to uncover the footprints. So what you're looking at here uh, in the photo, we've got um, Andrea, Emily and Teague, my three students at the University of Victoria. And in the video, you're watching Teague using a hammer and a chisel to clear out the last little bit of rock in a footprint that you can sort of start to see emerging. Um, and in the background, Kala is using a brush to sweep out a footprint that's just about all the way exposed. So this is very, um, very fine detail work. We have to be really careful that we don't chip the footprint. Um, but we find that usually the rock actually lifts off pretty cleanly from the footprint surface, which is really cool. So in just a couple of days with a few people working at it, we were able to uncover several more meters square of um, footprint site. Uh, so that means that next year when we go back, if we bring a nice big crew of people who are happy to haul buckets of rocks around for us for a few days, we should be able to uncover quite a bit more of the surface and see what other dinosaurs are found here. And I thought I'd also share a little bit about what it's like after we finish work at the track site. So every morning we would get up around 6.30 or 7 and try to be on the road by about 8. It took us about an hour to drive out to the track site and then it, we would work all day. And at the end of the day, we would come back. We were staying at a really nice lodge on Williston Lake that also had a campground. So the students were camping in tents and we were staying up in the lodge. And we would cook dinner every night together on our little stove, which only had two burners. So it took a little bit of juggling to make sure we got all the food cooked for everybody. We always plan and cook our meals together and share what we're eating. And um, that makes for a really nice communal day. After we ate dinner, we'd usually go back to the lodge and we would finish writing up our notes and talk about what we saw that day. We would do things like download all our photos and try running some of those 3D models to make sure everything was working well. Uh, and then we'd usually be pretty pooped. It'd usually be about 10 p.m. and that's when we would go to bed and get up and do it again the next day. But a couple days we had a little extra energy because we got our work done early and everybody on our team really likes board games and there were many, many fun dinosaur board games that were brought along on this trip. And I particularly liked uh, this one uh, or thought it was very funny. Uh, this is basically dinosaur operation, which I feel like is pretty good training if you want to be a person who picks at dinosaur bones out of the ground all the time. So, so that was a lot of fun. So we do have some fun too. Okay, so that's how we approached studying this dinosaur footprint site. So now is a really great opportunity to share some of the cool footprints that are actually found at this site. So this is one of the footprints that's one of the more common types of footprints we find. Um, dinosaur footprints actually get species names kind of like Tyrannosaurus rex or um, Brontosaurus, but they're not really a species like we would um, think of as like a living animal. So we use species names for footprints just as a way to give them a name and tell what types of dinosaurs are found there. So usually a footprint has a name and then we say that it matches this kind of dinosaur. Um, so it can be a little confusing. Um, this footprint species name is called Gypsychnites. It means the stony foot track, uh, which makes sense because these are footprints in the stone. This is from probably a medium sized plant eater. So most dinosaurs leave three toed footprints. They have three toes that go on the ground, kind of like birds do today and they leave three toed footprints. Not all of them, but a lot of them. Um, but we can tell differences between them, like how thick the toes are, uh, what the heel looks like, do they leave sharp claws or blunt hooves, and that can help us match them up to dinosaurs that we know based on their skeletons. So this one's a little tricky. It's probably a medium-sized animal. It doesn't have sharp claws and it has kind of thick toes, so it's probably from a plant eater. And I actually have a cast of this one over here if Liz wants to pass me one. Thank you. So here's an example of what we bring back from the field. Here is that, that's pretty, I think that's the same footprint that I was showing in the photo. So this is from not a tiny, tiny dinosaur, but not a huge dinosaur compared to some of the other ones that we saw. So you can see here that it's got its three toes, one, two, three. It doesn't have really sharp claws and it's got a nice round heel. So that's probably from a plant eater. And just so you can see, it's very flexible. There's our layers of silicone on the side. And then that's what it looks like on the back with that plaster jacket. And we give it a number so we know what type of, uh, what footprint it is and where we got it from that big track site because there's so many. So that's one example of one of the footprints that we have. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> All right, let's show a couple more photos. Uh, some of the other really common footprints at this track site are from uh, big meat eaters. So this is a much bigger footprint. You can see it has skinnier toes and it actually has some sharp claws when they're nicely preserved. So this is probably from a big meat-eating dinosaur 
At this point in time, T-Rex hasn't evolved yet. So this is probably more likely an animal that's similar to a dinosaur called Acrocanthosaurus. And I actually have a cast of this one. If Liz can help me lift it up, this is a big one. So I need a little, I need a second set of hands for this one. Dun, 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 dun. Drum roll, please. Drum roll. Oh. Da -da. All right, so let's bring it up closer here. So we're gonna go towards this way. And if we lift it up, this is actually two footprints at the same time. We're gonna come even a little more. So if you can see that big footprint that's pointing up, so there's three toes. I'm gonna see if I can balance it. You got it along the edge? Okay, so there's one, two, three. So that's one of our big dinosaur footprints. This is a footprint called Irenosaurus, and it means the, uh, the lizard foot from the Peace region after the Peace River that flows near it. Another dinosaur that we have is this big one next to it, and it's got much thicker toes and blunt toes. So this is a big plant eater, probably like Iguanodon at this time. So these ones were really close to each other. So we did two feet in one mold, which was really fun and challenging to do. So this was the biggest one that we collected this summer. We're gonna put it back on our card here and then I'll be back on the video screen. Okay. While you're putting it back, I'll just note really quick too, we've got so many questions coming into the chat. <laughs> Insane. I'm so excited for Q&A when we're done showing these last few pictures. This is great. <laughs> I can see them rolling in. I'm excited to answer them at the end. All right, and then two of the really special types of footprints are on this slide. So those are some of the really common ones. We've got a big plant eater, um, a little plant eater. Oh yeah, we have a little meat eater that I didn't show yet. So this is a little, a little bitty meat eater probably. So it's a very small footprint with very, very skinny toes and just the tiniest bit of a claw impression. Um, but that's much smaller than the Irenosaurus. This one is probably, this one is called Columbosaurus after British Columbia. And this one might be from a small meat eater like a relative of T-Rex. So Tyrannosaurs were actually really small at this point in time. Um, so that's one of the other types of dinosaurs that we that we saw. But there weren't very many of these, just a few of these footprints. Thanks, Liz. <clears throat> All right. And then our final couple of cool footprints that I wanted to show on the PowerPoint are um, these two. So on the left-hand side, where you see these big oval depressions, those are the hind feet of a sauropod dinosaur. So these are animals like Brontosaurus or Brachiosaurus that we really don't find fossils from in Canada usually. So we've never found their bones in Canada so far. Um, so in fact, these footprints are some of the only evidence that we have for sauropods in Canada at all. And the sauropod footprints at this uh, particular track site are only the second ones that really have been found uh, in British Columbia. So they're very, very rare and they're very cool. We have at least two trackways. So this one is one animal walking kind of towards us in this photo. And then in the back of this one, there's another one that crosses over in the opposite direction. So those are really cool. They're so big, they're really fun. We all like to sit in them and take our pictures in them, which is really fun. And they're just a really cool footprint. And then the final one that I think is really neat uh, is something that my student T Dixon, who's in this photo, is actually working on for their master's thesis. So I've mentioned before how most, uh, many dinosaurs walk with three toes on the ground. But if you've ever looked at, say, if you have a cat or dog at home, you know that they've got their claws that touch the ground and then they've got a little claw called a dew claw that doesn't usually touch the ground. So that's actually also true for a lot of dinosaurs. They have their three toes on the ground and then they have a little dew claw that's up higher on their foot, doesn't usually touch the ground and leave a toe impression in a footprint. But there's a couple dinosaurs that have a very long toe that does touch the ground sometimes, um, but they're very rare and they're very unusual to find their footprints. So this is an example of a four-toed footprint from a mystery dinosaur. We don't know exactly what dinosaur made this footprint yet. So that's part of what Teague is trying to figure out for their thesis. They're trying to figure out if this is a new species of dinosaur footprint that we haven't seen before, and then try to figure out what type of dinosaur left this footprint, how big it was, and what that tells us about how dinosaurs are changing in Canada and British Columbia at this point in time. So that's a really cool, exciting one. I'm very excited for Teague to finish this research over the next year and tell us more about it eventually. So this just gives you an idea of some of the different types of dinosaurs that we're finding about 110 million years ago in British Columbia. We've got on the left our two big plant eaters. We've got something like Iguanodon and something like Camptosaurus, if you've ever heard of Camptosaurus. We've got at least two meat eaters. We've got a big meat eater like Acrocanthosaurus and a little uh, meat eater that might be an early Tyrannosaur or something similar. And we've got a really, really big sauropod, uh, maybe something like Sauroposeidon or, um, or, or Brontomeris. Those are some other dinosaurs that live elsewhere in North America at this point in time. 
Plus, we've got Teague's mystery four-toed dinosaur that we haven't figured out yet. So, so that just gives us an idea. I'm sure that there's actually more footprints um, to be found on this site. We're looking for things like birds and pterosaurs, little things that wouldn't leave big footprints. One of the things that's missing that is very interesting to me is there's no armored dinosaur footprints here, even though they're really common in British Columbia. So one of the questions that we might want to ask is why don't we find armored dinosaur footprints at this particular track site? So that basically brings me to the end of the presentation. This is my team that was with us. Um, in the front, we've got Andrea, then Calla, Emily, Teague, myself, and Derek. We are laying down in the sauropod trackway, and so we're each laying in one of the sauropod footprints. Um, they all worked really, really hard with us this summer in some sometimes challenging smoky conditions. And we're so excited about what we're going to learn as we keep going back to this site. There's so many questions we have, like, why are there so many different types of dinosaurs here? What were they doing in this area? Were they looking for food or water? Um, what was the environment like that they were moving through? And what does it tell us about how dinosaurs are changing? So those are all questions we can answer as we keep going back and studying this site year after year. And um, yeah, and I hope that that gives you just a little introduction to dinosaur footprints and British Columbia dinosaurs and how we go about studying them. Thanks so oh, much for tuning in. Thank you so much for such an enthusiastic <laughs> presentation. The fact that we can even find fossilized tracks is like as magical to me now as it was when I was four. Like it's so, so <laughs> cool. It's like black magic. Also, that is the best operation game I've ever seen in the world ever. I want one. <laughs> um, classes youtubers if you guys have any questions on youtube we'll take as many as we can our three live classes are like super into it on the chat so what if we're going to try <laughs> go live to you always more fun to take questions live if we can hear you guys uh so miss green colton just shared a question in the chat but if you're willing to unmute your mic and say that in person i can come to you guys in just a sec Annika west miss lies class i'm coming to everyone in a minute and we'll <laughs> we'll dive in in fact uh Ms. oh there's miss green maybe oh, there we go. It wants to work. I'm thinking about it. Hi. Welcome <laughs> in. Go ahead, Colton. Uh, what was the biggest footprint that you guys have ever found? Oh, uh, I think some of the biggest ones I've ever seen were the ones at this track site, those big sauropod footprints that we're all laying in. They're really big. So they're at least about this long and about this wide and really deep, which is really cool because they're much deeper than the other footprints at the track site. It really tells you that those are really heavy dinosaurs because most of the dinosaurs leave a footprint about that deep and the sauropods leave them about that deep into the mud. So they're definitely sinking down further than the other guys. Very, very cool. I want to bring Colton on really quick just to say hi. We've got the camera working in Miss Green's class. So hi there, man. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great question. Uh, we will come back in a sec for more from you guys and really appreciate that one. Uh, Abaco West, Ms. Michael's group. Uh, there's so many of you joining in lunch hour today. If you want to share a question on behalf of your kids, come on in and uh, take us away. Hey. Let's see. Our, our camera doesn't seem to be... Who knows? Have, have the fun. <laughs> okay. So I have two that go together, Violet and Anya. Violet Barnes and Anya, come on up. Up, if you're not coming up, I'll close the next person. Okay, okay. they went to take their lunch trays back. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Elliot. Sorry, some of our trays come from the lunchroom. Elliot. Take your time, no hurry at all. <laughs> come on up. I'm over here. Yeah, I'm close here. That's why. Okay. Oh, oh there, well, we figured out the camera. Yeah, yeah more figured Ask out the camera. Ask a student. Ask a student, right? Yeah. Start yes. camera. Okay, yeah. here we here we go. Oh, no, that, that shut off all your devices, actually. So I will come back in a sec when you're ready. Yep, don't, wrong button. I'm going to go to Miss Lai's class. They've been sharing questions in the chat as well. And we'll see if we come back to Glenview in just a minute. But come on in, grade twos. Hi, welcome in. If you want to unmute, you can share with us. But I know you had a great question in the chat a minute ago. Hi. 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 There we go. Now we're unmuted. Ooh, yeah, you're perfect. Do you want to share a question with Victoria? Okay, who got a question? Remy, can you come up? When are dinosaurs underground? Why are dinosaurs underground? Oh, what a great question. Why are dinosaurs underground? So dinosaur bones are underground because a long time ago, like whenever they died, the bones had to be buried in order to be fossilized. So a lot of things have to happen in order for a dinosaur bone to get preserved from like 110 million years ago to now. Uh, the dinosaur has to not get eaten or broken up by being stepped on or, or degraded all the way by bacteria or mushrooms or things like that. It has to get buried in sand so that new minerals can flow through the water and fill in all of the holes in the bone. 
And usually the bones have to go pretty far underground in order to last for a really long time. Then they have to come back up to the surface through things like mountain building or erosion. And that's when we start to find them again. So that's why we find them deep underground most of the time. I hope that answered your question. It's a really big topic. It is a big topic. I was <laughs> going to say we can do many broadcasts just on fossilization yes. and how that process works. So very cool. Um, I would go ask, we're back. Just audio is fine. Just share a question with us. Come on up. Where's the background, please? Oh, yeah. I have two lines up. Oh, yeah. Uh, how many whole dinosaur-like structures have you made? Have you okay. found? How many whole skeletons? How many whole skeletons? So finding a whole skeleton is super rare. So most of the time you find individual bones or teeth or maybe parts of a skeleton. So I have usually only found like chunks of skeletons, but I've gotten to work on some very special dinosaurs that were basically full skeletons. A dinosaur I helped name a few years ago named Zool, which is an armored dinosaur, has all of its body except its legs. And that also includes its skin and all of its armor plates. But that's really, really rare. So we're always very excited when we find whole dinosaur skeletons. I am still waiting to find my whole dinosaur skeleton. Yes, many, many hundreds of things of varying bones, fossils, tracks, footprints. Victoria has been everywhere. She's done a lot of amazing <laughs> stuff. In fact, I was going to say this at the beginning. If you want to find out more about her, she has her own Wikipedia page. You can just go and look her up at the end, <laughs> even if she's cringing. It's amazing, and she's super cool and deserves one. Um, I'm going to do a second round of questions. Um, Ms. Green's class, if you want to flick on your camera mic, whatever, I'll bring you back in. You've had a bunch in the chat, but more fun to join us in person, I find. So come on back in and uh, take us away. Hey guys, let's see. Oh, Miss Green's class. I can share one. Oh, there we are. Hi. Oh, unmute again. Hi. We can hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lily. Why, why do you like studying dinosaurs? Ooh, why do I like studying dinosaurs? So I am one of those kids that really liked dinosaurs as far back as I can remember, and I never grew out of my dinosaur phase. So I was really lucky to have very supportive parents and teachers that helped me pursue a career in science. And then I've been really lucky to get a job in museums where I can think about dinosaurs all day. Um, I don't know. I just think they're cool. I think that it's so neat to think about what things were like in the past that are so different from today. And I like solving problems and trying to figure things out that people haven't figured out before. So I like dinosaurs for that reason. I love whenever we have paleontologists on, it's the same answer every time. It's like, everyone loves dinosaurs when they're four, and I just never stopped. <laughs> Greatest answer. Um, so thank you for that, Ms. Greenstaff. It's a really thoughtful question. And again, you know, follow those passions. You don't need to give up on these things that are really exciting when you're a kid. Often, most of the people we bring on these broadcasts had something that they really loved and they followed through with it in a really meaningful way. So I'm really glad we get that question. I'm going to go to Ms. Lai's class in just a second. I love this question on YouTube because it's my question too. Are there volunteer opportunities on dig sites for people who are not paleontology students? Can I come sit in a sauropod footprint with you or what's the deal? <laughs> yeah, it really depends on the site and who is leading the excavation. So in some of the places I go, I can't really take extra people because I have to take helicopters and they're really expensive. Um, in other places, if it's easier to get to and you can spread more people around, yeah, lots of people will take um, volunteers. So really the best thing you can do is sort of look at what museums or universities are nearby who might be doing dinosaur research or other fossil research and just reach out to them by email. Say that you're interested, see if there's opportunities to volunteer. And sometimes you can help out. It really, really depends. It's, it's, it's always every site is very different. But yeah, I have definitely had volunteers in the past and we'll probably have volunteers in the future. Amazing. Thank you so much for that question on YouTube. We're going to go to Ms. Lodge class and then we're going to sneak in one more with Ms. Michael's group before they head off for their next period. Uh, come on back in, grade twos. Hi. Uh, what's the first dinosaur called? Ooh, the first dinosaur Ooh, the first called. Dinosaur, like the first dinosaur that ever evolved? Yeah. That's, oh, that's a great question. You're testing me today because I don't work on dinosaurs that are that old usually. So some of the very earliest dinosaurs are things like Eoraptor and Eodromius. Those are some of the earliest examples of theropods or meat-eating dinosaurs and sauropods or the big long neck dinosaurs. They both are pretty small. Uh, and they're both known from Argentina. So some of the oldest dinosaurs that we know of come from Argentina. So we think that dinosaurs probably evolved at least in the Southern Hemisphere originally. Yeah, very, very cool. I was gonna, I'm checking while you're doing this, sorry, uh, for the first dinosaur we ever found, like ever as people, and it's not that far back. Like it's amazing how yeah. short the history of paleontology is. Megalosaurus comes to my mind, but I don't yeah. know. 
Is that yeah, still so the name of it or did it change? I think the very first dinosaur, uh, well, some of some of the very first dinosaurs are Megalosaurus and Iguanodon. Yes. Um, and those were found in the UK. So at least the first ones that Western people, like Europeans, named in sort of the scientific way that we talk about them now. But of course, probably lots of people saw dinosaur fossils and had ideas about them before the way that we talk about paleontology now. And that would vary by country and country and culture to culture. And I don't know as much about that. So that's something I always like learning about. Me too. I was going to uh, plug for our kids. Uh, the, the rhyme you might have heard, she sells seashells by the seashore, which I nailed on the first try. And I'm so proud of myself, is related to an actual fossil hunter, Mary Anning. Everyone should know about Mary Anning. You should all look her up when you're done this program. Lots of cool opportunity for learning there. Um, the sort of classic example of citizen science, by the way, just a, a plug for her and you as well. Illinois, we're heading back to Glenview. Ms. Michael, come on back in and take us away. You're good to go. Okay, I've got a, I've got a few, a few lined up here. So go for it, Violet. Um, so how long do dinosaurs pee? How long how do they? Pee? How do dinosaurs pee? Yep, that's a no. fun question. I don't totally know the answer to that question. So <clears throat> the the living relatives of dinosaurs are birds, and birds don't really pee. If you've ever had like a bird splat on you, they don't really pee the way mammals do. So mammals kind of pee and poop out of like two different spots. And birds actually do everything out of one spot, basically. They have something called a cloaca, and they just kind of have like one thing come out of them. So maybe dinosaurs were the same? I actually don't know. Um, there's something I'm gonna be Googling later today. <laughs> Stop the scientist, this is half the fun. Yeah. And I know yeah. uh, in Glenview, you have a bunch of classes together, so I'm gonna come for one more question from you, and then we're gonna wrap up from there. So share one more with us. Yeah, you're good. Um, how long do dinosaurs poop and pee? This is Anya. Well, that was the same question. <laughs> you did that one. I know you're really, you're I on have, the- I have another question. I don't know the answer to that question. So maybe you guys should could do some research. That's something you could do in, as a grown up and study, baby. Okay. I'm gonna have okay. Ivy come up then. Go ahead, Ivy. Ivy. How do dinosaur fossils end up in different places? Oh, that's a great question. How do dinosaur fossils end up in different places? So it has to do partly with where the dinosaurs lived. So the dinosaurs that we find in Canada lived here in what we didn't call Canada back then, obviously. Um, dinosaurs could also move around, so they might migrate, kind of like how di like animals migrate across big distances today. We think some dinosaurs might have done that across North America. Uh, and then dinosaurs also have moved around as the continents move. So some dinosaurs actually probably were, were living uh, in chunks of land that were connected. A really good example is that we find Stegosaurus in the United States and also in places like Portugal, uh, which are not close together today, but they used to be joined up in one continuous landmass when Stegosaurus was alive. So because of a thing called plate tectonics with the continents moving around, sometimes dinosaurs end up in different places um, than we might expect, which is pretty cool. I love that we managed to sneak in plate tectonics into this broadcast. Some of these students, you're like four or five years away from hearing about this in a really big way, but it's so cool. It's so amazing cool. to think about. Honestly, I've been grinning ear to ear the entire broadcast, which means my face kind of hurts actually, and I have a whole other program to do. So I will note, if you guys are keen to learn more, uh, check out the amazing digital field trips of the Royal BC. Um, what am I? Sorry, joking myself. There we are. Um, We've got the learning page, the Royal BC Museum. I'll make sure all our classes have this. You can check out the Royal BC Museum's website here. Um, and I really encourage you, if you've got Apple TV, Prehistoric Planet is an amazing series, like the best series ever. Walking with Dinosaurs used to be the best, and Prehistoric Planet might actually beat it. It's got really cool stuff. And Life on Our Planet's coming out on Netflix. If you want to find more dinosaur action, it's like dinosaurs are inundating you now. It's a very exciting time to be keen on dinosaurs. Victoria's at the vanguard of that, but there's like the best <laughs> discoveries ever being made right now as you guys are sitting here. So, kids, thank you so much for joining the enthusiasm. I'm going to bring in all our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Ms. Green, I'm going to go west. Ms. Lodge class, if you want to unmute your mics. And join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. You are all in the broadcast. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Bye. 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 Bye.